I'm Ilica Vomčilović, science journalist, science editor of the science program of Radio Television of Serbia and president of the World Federation of Science Journalists. Welcome today on today's panel on solar radiation modification. I'm joined here in person with uh, Sikina Gina, professor of environmental studies, affiliated graduate faculty of politics, University of California, Santa Cruz. Welcome. Janos Pastor. Executive Director of Carnegie Climate Governance Initiative. And online, we have Frank Bierman, Professor of Global Sustainability Governance and uh, at the Copernicus Institute of Sustainable Development, Utrecht University. Good afternoon. Pascal Lamy, a former Director General of the World Trade Organization and former EU Trade Commissioner, now President of the Paris Peace Forum. Czech Vermeer Okireke, Professor of Global Climate and Environmental Governance and Director of Center for Climate and Development at AE Funai in Nigeria. Gernot Wagner, Climate Economist, Columbia Business School, columnist at Bloomberg Green. Welcome all, hope you can hear us well. So global scientific community has already started to increase interest in controversial emerging climate altering technique called solar radiation modification, also known as solar geoengineering. There is a fear that future societies could give in to technofix attitudes, potentially damaging current climate change mitigation policies. And on the other hand, solar geoengineering is gaining prominence in climate change debates and as an issue worth of studying and potential future policy option. Regardless of the position, everyone agrees that planet's future is in great risk and people and governments must act on it. So I would refer my first question to Mr. Lamy, because you recently <laughs> said governments were increasingly likely to explore the possibilities of geoengineering as efforts to cut greenhouse gas emissions. How urgent is it for countries to argue, agree sorry, uh, on a way of controlling and regulating attempts to geoengineer the climate, and why? 
Well, hello everybody. Uh, yes, uh, I'm participating in the discussion as a chair of this uh, Climate Overshoot Commission, uh, which uh, the Paris Peace Forum has uh, created to look into a variety of options, uh, given uh, the unfortunately extremely high likelihood that uh, we will overshoot uh, 1.5 degree, uh, with the catastrophic uh, consequences we all know this will have. So we have to review a number of options that had not been seriously considered or seriously enough considered or implemented, such as adaptation, such as carbon removal, and such as uh, SRM, uh, as we say in this uh, geoengineering solar radiation modification community, which, as you just said, uh, is a very devising topic uh, for scientists, uh, for politicians, for civil society, uh, with one main argument for looking seriously at this option, uh, which is that it seems to be a rather radical way of keeping uh, temperature with less warming than otherwise, and one or two degrees uh, may be, may be in sight, and that uh, in these conditions uh, we should not leave any stone unturned. So we have to look at this option. Uh, that's the main argument in favor. Uh, there are two main arguments against this option. Uh, the one from science, uh, this is uh, too risky, uh, given uh, possible unintended consequences of using uh, solar radiation modification devices, such as spreading uh, pellets in the stratosphere. And the second is a more political uh, argument against, uh, which is that there's a risk of uh, trumping other options which are preferable, starting of course by mitigation, uh, but also uh, or adaptation or even carbon removal. So what we are doing with this uh, Climate Overshoot Commission, with uh, colleagues uh, with a lot of international experience, with a uh, scientific uh, support uh, by a secretariat. Uh, we are uh, looking at this under all angles and with all sides in order, uh, and that's uh, our intention, to come roughly a year from now uh, with uh, recommendations, possibly, possibly setting uh, the institutional precautions, the conditions under which some deployment of some SRM in some places uh, would be uh, acceptable. Uh, but of course, uh, this doesn't change the fact that uh, the main option remains mitigation and that, of course, we all have to keep pushing on this. That's my as short as possible answer to your question. Thank you. <laughs> Professor Bierman, Last January, a group of 63 prominent natural and social scientists published an open letter calling upon governments to work towards an international non-use agreement on solar geoengineering. Why? Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much for, for inviting me, first of all. And uh, sorry that I cannot be there in person. I would really like to be there and join the discussions in person. Um, from my perspective, on the perspective of most of my colleagues in this initiative, uh, we believe that we have today one of the most decisive moments in climate policy, actually. We have a moment where most governments have agreed to reduce their emissions, not sufficiently so, but they are in the process of increasing their targets, they are increasing their policies. More and more people are accepting the need to reduce emissions. The prices for renewable energies are falling. We see indication that within the next generation, we can make the transition 
to a fossil fuel free world. There's of course no guarantee, as Pascal Lamy has said, the struggle will be hard, unprecedented, but I believe it's possible. And we know also from the IPCC, the most recent IPCC report, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, that there are different pathways that allow us to reach the goals of maximum 1.5 or 2 degrees warming without solar radiation management. This is very clear from the IPCC, and the IPCC does not mention in the summary for policymakers the SAM or the solar geoengineering option with one single word. It's not mentioned. And then at this precise moment, and that's my concern here, uh, a small group of advocates is coming now and arguing that solar engineering could be a second option, an additional option, that it would help us to reduce the speed of mitigation policies, it would help to buy time, and maybe also it help us to use oil and gas a little bit longer because there is this credible pl cheap plan B of solar geoengineering, solar radiation management. So the argument is implicitly that we could have maybe a future in which 1,000 airplanes, up to 1,000 airplanes, are flying around the planet 20 kilometers height, injecting aerosols and all sorts of stuff into the stratosphere. And they would do this for 20, 30, 40, 50, maybe 100 years to artificially cool the planet without resolving the root causes of climate change. And I'm deeply afraid about this particular discussion that is now gaining speed. I think, number one, this discussion will delay and it will derail all existing climate policy programs. It will demobilize politicians, it will demobilize uh, businesses, it might demobilize also citizens, because in all these transformation processes that we have to have, there is then the speculative new idea that we could also do ge geoengineering to not have these major transformations right now that we need. And secondly, I believe, and I'm afraid personally, that these technologies will lead to a further increase in greenhouse gas emissions, they are targeting the temperature target, they're not targeting concentrations of greenhouse gases. That means my daughter and on the future generations will be locked in in the future of very high carbon dioxide emissions that will be masked by a world of geoengineering by some countries that would implement these technologies. And therefore also the third point is, I believe that there is right now no plausible governance system by which these technologies can ever be regulated at the international level. So I'm a political scientist. I come from this, from the perspective of global governance. I read many of the books of the SAF advocates, and I have not seen any plausible system of governance. Uh, if you just watch the news today, we have a war in Ukraine, we have Putin, we have the Chinese, we have the Americans and NATO. We are maybe we are even threatening a nuclear war in, in certain places. Can anybody imagine that these countries together would run a solar geoengineering program with 1,000 airplanes for 50 years? I think this is not plausible at the current time, and therefore I think this is a very, very dangerous and risky idea. As I said, the IPCC has shown this is not necessary if there's political will, political engagement to do it without solar engineering. And for that reason, it's now actually 350, so it's not no longer 60 scientists, but 350 a scientists from over 50 countries endorsed by many NGOs have come together and we have published an open letter that anybody can check on the website on which we are calling against the normalization of climate hacking as a policy option. We are calling for an international non-use agreement on solar geoengineering. And this non-use agreement would refrain from using solar engineering and would not normalize and develop such technology. That's our proposition, and we hope that many countries, United Nations agencies, uh, and other actors, universities, research councils, will eventually join this call that has been launched by 350 scientists from the, both the natural and the social sciences. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Pastor, do we need to start managing the consequences of climate change? Because the governance takes time, international. Well, luckily, we have started already. Uh, so I, I, I think the, the answer to your question is yes, we have to continue uh, to do that. Uh, but uh, at the same time, I think it's very important, and I come back to what Pascal Lamy said at the beginning, that, uh, in fact, uh, there is not sufficient attention being paid to the fact of how serious a climate crisis we are in today. 
uh, the, 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 the fact that we will be overshooting the 1.5 degree, even under the most optimistic IPCC scenarios, the one Frank Biermann ref referred to, the, the most optimistic ones will overshoot, more likely than not. And that, those most optimistic scenarios were prepared before the war in Ukraine. And even then, uh, the IPCC itself recognized how difficult it would be to achieve those most optimistic pathways. So the fact is that we're getting into a much hotter world and we need to manage the risk. Now, fundamentally, there are, there are two families of options that the world can do to manage the risk. One is to increase sub substantially uh, adaptation, resilience, and find ways to support communities, countries that are currently already being impacted and having damages because of climate change. Let's not look further than Pakistan right now. That's one family of options. Another one is potentially solar radiation modification. And there aren't too many other options. Uh, emission reductions and carbon removal is absolutely necessary, number one priority. But we know that simply doing those is not enough to keep the temperature below 1.5. And therefore, the question is, how do we uh, have a conversation, an intelligent conversation between those who want uh, this new technique and those who don't want to have this technique, how do we have a conversation uh, where the different perspectives, the different ways of interpreting and living risks can come together and find some kind of a solution? It will be very difficult to do, no question about that. Everything is very difficult in today's world, uh, but uh, the alternative is not to do anything, and there I think we're running into serious trouble. Thank you. Professor Gina. You're working on, uh, on developing theoretically obtained recommendations for the governance of solar geoengineering. So what's your focus on? So my, my current focus is really thinking about how do we expand the tent. So if you look at maps of climate vulnerability globally, um, we see that most countries that are most vulnerable to climate change are those that have contributed least to the problem historically and have least capacity to adapt. And when you think about who has been contributing to the conversations and the research on solar geoengineering, over 90% of that research has come from North America and Europe. So those countries that are most vulnerable to climate change have been largely in the academic literature left out of the conversation. Um, and that is literature looking at everything from philosophy to physics, so across disciplines. So the project that I'm working on at the moment is trying to think about how do we expand that tent, how do we have a better understanding of what global publics in all countries think about um, solar geoengineering as a possible part of a climate change response portfolio with a focus on um, looking at the world's most vulnerable um, communities in, in countries that have thus far been left out of the debate. And if we look at, I'm working with a couple of my graduate students right now in the preliminary phase of this, sort of reviewing all of the literature that looks at any sort of public perception data on solar geoengineering, and our preliminary findings show that you know, the vast majority also of this uh, public perception literature is, uh, takes place with publics in North America and Europe, um, and less than 15% of those studies are looking at what communities in the Global South might actually think about this um, potential response measure. So my personal perspective is not, you know, I don't fall into the we need it or we don't need it, but let's learn a little bit more about this before we make any decisions about what's best for the world's most vulnerable. Professor Okireke. Being the only representative from Global South here at the panel, how do you feel about solar geoengineering as a part of climate policy portfolio? Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, my uh, overriding em uh, emotion is that of fear, but also I feel a little bit anger. Uh, I feel angry because we have sketched now three baskets of uh, actions that can be taken uh, to enable uh, the poor countries that have contributed the least uh, to climate change to uh, adapt. We have said that one basket of option is radical mitigation by those that have caused the problem and transformation. We have identified the second basket uh, by a pastor uh, as uh, emphasis on climate resilient development uh, and adaptation. 
And I am not sure why we want to begin to explore the third option when uh, there is still a huge uh, headroom. We haven't done anywhere near those first two options. Okay. Uh, I want to understand why, uh, despite all the National Adaptation Plan of Action prepared by African countries, I run around the 54 African countries helping them to prepare these NAPAs, and then later we were asked to turn it into NAPs. We did comply, and yet only 16% of the projects that we prepared were ever funded. I want to understand why I was again sent to go and help African countries to prepare their nationally determined contribution. Now we did that, uh, and now we identified three trillion investment opportunity in our nationally determined contribution, and Africa has received next to nothing of the sort of amount of money that they require to implement. I have gone around telling African heads of state, you have to engage with climate change because it presents an opportunity for you to build climate resilience infrastructure and uh, develop in a cleaner way. They are now turning to me and say, you sold us a lie. We believed you. We prepared the plans. We didn't get the money. And suddenly the discussion is shifting to some kind of delay tactics, some kind of risky delay tactics that will buy time for more pollution, buy time for more use of SUV cars, buy more time for oil companies to keep polluting and consequently endangering the economic uh, development of Africa uh, and putting us much more into poverty. Quite frankly, the emphasis should be on supporting Africa in the area of adaptation that has you already mentioned, but also to build their climate uh, resilience infrastructure. Now, as uh, Skinner has uh, eloquently articulated, only 2% of the research funding that has come uh, in the area of green growth globally has gone to Africa. We think that that 2% is small until you then realize that 98% of that 2% slide, uh, the money has actually uh, uh, gone to uh, North American scholars, okay? So this idea of, you know, uh, uh, intellectual domination is really frightening. We have only 2% of investment of renewable energy in Africa, 2%, and yet Africa has all the sun, all the wind, all the geothermal to develop is energy potential and indeed also supply to the rest of the world. The last time I saw a contingent from Europe come to Africa in the past five years has now been to ask Africa to please allow them invest more in gas. Oh, not gas to supply Africa, but gas to supply Europe. So Africa suddenly becomes important again because Europe needs gas. This is not how to do diplo climate diplomacy. When last do we have African heads of state in the room where the decisions that are important will be made? We still remember, we haven't recovered from the shock of Copenhagen, where African heads of state were locked out of the door of the room where the final the deal was hammered. And so I fear that even if somehow anybody is able to manufacture some kind of effective solar radiation management measures, African heads of state and government will not be part of the decision making. Uh, platform, and it will be another sort of, you know, stratospheric, you know, uh, domination and colonization. Therefore, I would like to enjoin all of us to please put our attention on mitigation and adaptation uh, and supporting Africa to adapt uh, and build climate resilient infrastructure. Uh, Skinner mentioned that this kind of has to do with climate justice. I think the converse is true as I have sought to, to demonstrate. Uh, powering ahead with this kind of uh, research will be the most uh, egregious climate injustice that will be done to Africa. Thank you. Thank you. Before I go to Mr. Wagner, Mr. Lamid, do you want to follow up on Professor Okiraka? Well, very, very rapidly, reacting to uh, the points that have been made. First, I totally agree 
that so far the conversation on adaptation, removal, and SRM has been uh, captured uh, by the norm, which is why when I composed this uh, Climate Overshoot Commission, I made sure that roughly two-thirds of the members would come from the South, including, by the way, a rather large uh, contingent from Africa uh, for the reasons uh, that uh, Chuck just gave. Uh, second, uh, this Climate Overshoot Commission uh, will not look only at solar radiation modification, but also at adaptation and at carbon removal. And we will make, I'm not able <laughs> to give you details because the work is still going on for one year, but I'm pretty convinced now that we will, this commission will make quite radical proposals on the adaptation side of the equation, which uh, for the moment uh, is uh, vastly underfinanced. And we will have a taste of this discussion uh, at uh, Sharm el uh, in, a, in a few weeks. Third, uh, to uh, react to what uh, Professor Bierman said, I agree with him on one thing and I disagree on one thing. I agree with him uh, that so far, as far as SRM is concerned, there is no blueprint from a proper governance of SRM internationally. That's absolutely true, uh, which is why, which is why uh, we have to look at this in detail and try to see whether or not there is a proper answer to this question, which for the moment, I totally agree with him, has remained unanswered. Uh, where I don't agree uh, with uh, you, Professor, uh, is that although I'm not a scientist at all, I have uh, very good friends uh, of mine who are scientists, and what they've told me, for most of them, and what I've read in literature and theory for a long time, is that a scientist should not be afraid of a discussion. So there is no discussion that we should be afraid of if we take the scientific angle, which is why, which is why we have to open this question. And I'm not saying, and this will depend on the views of the members of the commission I have the privilege to share for one more year. Uh, we open the question with no a priori. The only a priori is that, as Janos said, the likelihood to overshoot 1.5 is now considerable with dramatic consequences, uh, including on the African continent, which of course for us Europeans uh, maybe uh, matters uh, more than uh, others for obvious reasons. So. Uh, let me just state at this stage of discussion that I consider, and I think this is the unanimous view in the Commission at this stage, that the order of plan is a plan A, mitigation, plan B, adaptation, and plan C, maybe carbon removal, if you can put it at scale, and maybe SRM, if a proper international governance system can be found. That's my reaction at this stage. Thank you. Mr. Wagner, in your latest book, uh, Geoengineering the Gamble, you argue that geoengineering may only be a matter of time. So it's not if, but when. Can you elaborate on this? <laughs> uh let me try, but let me first violently agree uh, with Chuck. Uh, radical mitigation, I really like this term. Yes, of course. Uh, priorities one through however many must be to cut CO2 emissions. Remove the CO2 that's already there, right? Which in many ways, sort of to an economist, in many ways is simply expensive mitigation as well. 
Uh, and of course, none of this should detract from the need to adapt to what's already in store. Um, now, to your question, right, not if, but when, um, everything I think we do know about solar geoengineering, uh, solar radiation modification, and yes, there are lots of things we don't know. There is a need for research. Of course there is. Ignorance is never the right answer. Um, but everything we do know, I think, does point in the direction that it is not a question of if, but a question of when. Now, I'm not saying if or uh, uh, when in the sense of right, solar radiation modification will come in, dwarf everything, and so on. No, of course not. But will somebody somewhere try, attempt to try? Big question, of course, is who that somebody is. No, not some crazed billionaire necessarily, but I would like to think that the national security advisor in Pakistan would be remiss not to mention the possibility right about now. Um, and yes, that's the question, right? This is no longer climate, unmitigated climate change is no longer sort of an environmental concern that you put in one bucket um, of the discussion. It is a security, a national security, of course, also an economic question. Um, and to what Pascal Ami said at the very end, um, right, so first of all, yes, the categorization, um, mitigation, adaptation, carbon removal, uh, potential research in SRM, and that is probably the right ordering here. Um, and yes, it is also too late to decide to forego a set of technologies and simply not worry about it. Now, I understand the moral hazard concerns, right? The concerns of uh, Frank Behrman um, um, formulated them at first um, along the lines of, um, uh, you know, if solar radiation management detracts from since, of course, there is the potential that it detracts from the need to mitigate. That is a worry. That is a concern. That is something to be addressed and, frankly, to nip in the butt immediately. Right? Now, it's already too late for that in many ways. In the U.S., for example, the former Speaker of the House of Representatives, Newt Gingrich, has already written the op-ed 12 years ago that said, ha, huh, don't need to cut CO2 emissions. I just saw the solution out there. Let's just solar geoengineer our way out of this dilemma. Right? That has already, that's already entered the conversation on one side of the aisle. Um, of course it would, of course it has. And it's not for us scientists to decide now, even if 350 of us to say, oh, let's not research this because if we don't, we can avoid the conversation. No, unfortunately, we can't. Professor Biermann. Oh, I mean, um, thank you so much. Um, well, I'm a kind of um, agree very much with this, what, what, what Gernot uh, described as, um, as the mitigation um, deterrence. I just have a different interpretation. I think that's a major danger. It is happening. I'm very sure it will be happening. So my argument is also to what uh, Pascal Lamy has said, that SRM will make everything worse. It's not part of the solution. It will raise the emissions further. We will have a world with 450 parts per million carbon dioxide concentrations and even more for hundreds of years. For example, I looked at a study from the organization that Janos Pastor is representing. It's a new paper that came out and they have a conceptual framework of emissions reduction, carbon dioxide removal, solar radiation modification, et cetera. And in this conceptualization, emissions are peaking in the year 2300. I mean, this is an official study from the Climate Governance Initiative, and it says that solar radiation management would continue for about 2,250, and the emissions would peak in 2,300 in this particular graph that is titled Proposed Complementary Roles of Approaches to Reduce Climate Change and Its Impact. So this is kind of some part of the discussion that maybe the emissions uh, will continue for a very long time, will not be reduced, and that for solar radiation management, we would probably have to do this for over 100 years. And I fully disagree with the 
idea that we will find. I mean, I think I disagree also with one point that scientists cannot decide. I hear from all the supporters of geoengineering consistently that they say mitigation is important, or I hear Pascal Lamy, they said that good governance is needed. Scientists are not important. That's very important. What scientists want will not necessarily happen. What the Overshoot Commission wants will not necessarily happen. They can make proposals, they can make blueprints, they will not necessarily implement it by governments. What will be implemented in terms of governance will be, if at all, some type of great power arrangement along the lines of the Security Council, where the United States, maybe other countries will try to collaborate in a huge conflictive space. Africa will not be involved. I have a, if you read the papers that are dealing with geoengineering governance, and I read quite a few of them, that's why I'm so against it, actually, because I really immerse myself in the literature. Everybody talks about great power alignment. They talk about some types of the, the, the big powers have to decide that this is not a democratic way. It's not a fair way. And this is what I'm very afraid will happen. A future with high concentrations, geoengineering for hundreds of years or 100 years in a way that will be run by the major powers alone. And most people envision here the United States of America doing this. And I think that's a future that I don't like. And it is not necessary. And that's very important. There's this normalization in the discussion that climate policies will fail. And this is by itself political agency, by itself. The advocates and the Overshoot Commission also, they're talking down current climate policies, and this is a big danger, by normalizing the idea of solar gene engineering, by normalizing the idea of carbon dioxide removal, they're reducing the incentives for drastic transformative change. And I think this is a big problem. It's a big responsibility also for the Overshoot Commission looking at, because I know the career, I mean, I have a lot of respect for Mr. Lamy and all his work, but I think this is a huge political responsibility that they're normalizing in a way that we will not make them emission reductions. And that they also, for example, are working with a set of scientific advisors that are also very much in favor of geoengineering. I mean, that is also, I think, I mean, if you look at the website, if you look at the scientific advisors, these are the leading advocates of geoengineering. Why is, for example, Professor Okereke could also be a perfect advisor to the Overshoot Commission, not in a 10 minutes intervention, but as a structural advisor. David Keyes, together with Chucks Okereke, this would be a fantastic sparring partner. And then the Overshoot Commission would engage very, very interesting discussions. I can be guaranteeing that this would be interesting. So therefore, I think that, uh, that the normalization of, of the failure of climate policy is a big danger. And for that reason, and here I disagree also with Gerhard Wagner, and I'm closing now, I think they can stop it actually. It's not that this will happen. I think it's not necessarily that it's only research governance, but if governments agree on not using solar geoengineering as a technology, then it will not happen. We have banned chemical weapons, we have banned biological weapons, we have banned anti-person landmines, we are banning human cloning, we are banning so many things. Mining in Antarctica, for example, the world is full with prohibitions in international law. Geoengineering would just be one tiny additional prohibition. It will be important, it's possible. And this is what we are kind of trying to get, uh, uh, recommending also with the 350 scientists that have called for this non-use agreement on solar geoengineering. Thank you. Mr. <laughs> yes, thank you. I, I just like to come in on a, on a couple of points. Uh, I'll try to be brief, but there are many points. So first of all, I think we live in a very complicated, very messy, very imperfect world. And there are many things that are happening that seem to be beyond our control. Uh, we can throw up our hands and say, OK, it's just too complicated. The big powers are going to fix this on their own, or we can try to do the best we can to try to make this world a little bit better. Now, the same governments who seem to be uh, desired to make an agreement to stop uh, solar radiation modification, they can also make it happen. So that's the, that's the idea. Governance can make it something happen or can stop something happen. But we need that governance. We need to find ways to address these issues. You heard in this very panel, we have passionately different views about this uh, issue. Some of us are impartial, others are pushing it, others are not. That is part of life. We have different views, but it is through governance processes that those different perspectives can be expressed so that we can hear the global south, the global north, the scientists from the global south, and there are some uh, increasingly so as well. Now, 
solar radiation modification cannot solve the climate crisis. Let's be absolutely clear. The only thing that can solve the climate crisis is emission reductions and removing the excess carbon from the atmosphere. That's the only thing that can solve it. But we know from the IPCC, the latest information, that all that em emission reductions and carbon removal is taking time. And even under the most optimistic scenarios, and I repeat this, because many of the things we've talked about, radical transformative emission reductions, that's already part of those scenarios. It will be difficult to keep below, it will not be possible to keep below 1.5, even under those most optimistic ones. So that is the challenge that we're facing. So the IPCC, yes, it talks about SRM, not in the summary for policymakers that many people refer to, not as summary uh, for, but summary by policymakers, but never mind. But in the detailed report, it's very clear. Solar radiation modification can be a supplement, a supplement to all what we need to do on emission reduction and carbon removal. It will come with a benefit, and it will come with some new risks. And we have to find that balance of how the new risks uh, compare to the high temperature world. And the last point uh, I just want to make briefly, uh, Pascal, I'd like to slightly disagree with you what you said about your categorization A, B, and C. But I think we talk about the same. But I think it's very dangerous to talk about plan A, plan B, plan C. Because there has to be only one plan which includes all those. And that's the challenge, is to find governance frameworks that can make the connection so we don't have a moral hazard of reducing the energy, sorry, the, the effort to, to reduce our emissions while we may be looking at carbon removal and some other options. So we have to find governance frameworks that connect these two. So there is one plan, plan A, and plan A has to include adaptation, uh, resilience, emission reductions, carbon removal, and maybe solar radiation modification. Well, we don't know yet. We have to figure that out. Professor Gina. Thank you. Um, I also have several comments I'd like to make in relation to what's been said by several of the speakers. I'll, I'll focus on four points. Um, so first, I think it's worth stating out loud that one thing we all agree on, despite having very divergent perspectives on what role, if any, solar geo should play in any future climate response portfolio, is that mitigation and adaptation must come first. And other speakers have said that, but I do want to just drive that home, that that is, you know, any, any scholar or um, practitioner worth their salt working in this area is, makes that point first, right? So we all agree on that. Nobody's talking about any, anything goes solar geoengineered future. Um, the second point is that several folks have mentioned the moral hazard associated with solar geo. So the idea that if we turn our attention towards solar geoengineering, we necessarily turn our attention away from mitigation and adaptation. And I, I just want to underscore that that's a conjecture, right? So this is, uh, we actually don't know if the moral hazard exists in this context. And there's been very little research. It's another area where we need more research. Um, there's a really interesting study that came out earlier this year that actually argues the opposite. Um, Todd Cherry, Juan Reno Cruz, and some others in environmental politics um, have a great study which argues the opposite. Um, the third is, you know, Chuck, much of what you said resonates incredibly strongly with me, and, and I also am really angry <laughs> about the state of global climate politics. Um, one thing that I want to push on a little bit is that I think it's too early for us to know whether solar geo is an injustice or not. Um, I think that there, it's, it's possible that you're absolutely right, and um, it's possible in a couple years I'll be behind there <laughs> hitting the table with you on that point. But I just don't think we have enough information yet to know what the, whether it would be a global injustice or a contribution to global justice. Um, you know, the Global South, as, as we all agree, I'm sure is not a monolith. There's lots of different types of opinions and interventions. And if we look at the preliminary studies that have looked at public perception in the Global South, you actually see quite a lot of variation there, and interestingly, you see a much more openness in those preliminary studies towards thinking about solar geo as a possible um, topic to explore. Not, a, a, not a advocacy for use, but a, as a possibility to explore as part of that um, response portfolio. And um, finally, I, I think, you know, I want to comment on something that Frank said. I absolutely agree with you that I think the, um, the Overshoot Commission should be thinking about how to diversify the perspectives um, which are providing high-level input. Um, you know, when I look at you know everything from your your um, the head of your secretariat to your scientific advisors, you you are um, relying very heavily on 
folks who are associated with strong advocacy um, for solar geoengineering, and I think that's, that's fine if you've decided that that's the direction you want to go, but I, I worry, I mean, I really love the project, and I'm really excited you're doing it, and I hope that it, I think the legitimacy of the outcome or the output of that um, project will be stronger and more robust if the inputs, um, it, the advisory inputs are a little bit more diverse. Um, so I think Frank is absolutely right that someone like Chuck, who's done amazing work um, in the field of global environmental politics and several others, um, who could provide more balanced perspective on, on how the um, Overshoot Commission is developing its positions would be really valuable for the ultimate output of the, of the work. Thanks. Thank you. Do we have questions in the audience? Yes, we have. Could we have a microphone? Thank you. Uh, thank you. My name is uh, Hans van der Loor from the Blue Cooling uh, Coalition, Blue Cooling Initiative. Um, I have a comment. I mean, many of the speakers talk about geoengineering as if it is new. We started with geoengineering 180 years ago, and it's called industrialization, which is the biggest geoengineering project ever taken on the planet. Secondly, most people seem to confuse SRM with only one of six categories of technology. All the speakers that mentioned examples exclusively gave examples about stratospheric aerosol injection, which indeed is effective in cooling, effective in cost, but indeed has unintended consequences and a very long inertia period. But what if I told you that there is a methodology that is slightly less effective in cooling, slightly less effective in cost, but has no unintended consequences and can be stopped in five days? Why could you even think about proclaiming a non-use or non-research proclamation? That sounds like forbidding books, forbidding knowledge, and will the next stage be Inquisition? I think we're now in the 21st century, to be exact, in the third decade of the third millennium. And I completely agree with the way that Janos Pastos has been presenting it. It is not either or, it is and, 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 but you're quite right in an overall governance part. And for those that live in fear, I have sympathy for that as well. But we no longer have a world of purity where we can choose between good and bad, that actually stopped probably in the late 80s. We now live in a world where the choice is between bad and less bad. And if we do not want to choose, the choice will become between bad and very bad. Thank you. Any other question, please? <laughs> Why is a comment unwelcome? Why just no, it's welcome. It's welcome. Okay. But I would also like to, to hear some questions for our guests. So, are the because we have online so guests and they need to go. Because of due to bad hearing and poor brains, I'm not sure whether I totally agree with what was said or whether I totally report. But I like to make that comment. I am surprised that we have like conspirators to hide in the smallest room at the end of the corridor to address the issue of geoengineering. This issue has been, let's say, lingering for years. It's very rarely openly discussed. As soon as you try just to, to mention the words, people react hysterically as if you had taken their bone away from their, their uh, um, uh, plate. plate. So, we have the uh, president of the uh, Galileo, La Lunette de Galilee, I don't know what you call it in English. I feel it's a remake. Uh, uh, we have in Lausanne, I think at EPFL, some uh, uh, scientists like Suren Erkman, they favor geoengineering, uh, rightly or wrongly. As soon as you mention the name, Dominique Bourg, comes up, uh, out, and he started uh, shout, shouting and insulting, etc. So I am curious, I am not, my religion is not made yet on that, but I f find strange the way this debate is developing, and, or rather not developing, since 
the start. And then you want a simple and efficient recipe against uh, 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 global warming. Vladimir Putin has it. You slaughter three quarters of the world's population. Another one, you cut all the wages by 90%. That would work, probably, but I don't know that if that's the one we are going to pursue. Anyone care to give a sh short comment or question? <laughs> A question, Thank uh, you. encompassing the comments that were made, um, what we've learned is that if there's no open conversation, we really uh, are shooting ourselves in the foot because then things happen without proper conversation and one side of the world sides on one side and does something and the other side of the world does something different. So what do you recommend? Uh, the best way to create a dialogue, not only on one solution for um, uh, solar radiation mitigation, but um, all possible solutions and a way for scientists to perhaps come up with completely new approaches. What is the best way to get that collaboration going? Thank you. Uh, maybe Mr. Lamy can start because he needs to leave. Soon. <laughs> very, very. Uh, no, I, I'm, I'm just, uh, just have to be in time. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, let me take the last question first. Uh, the Climate Overshoot Commission has as a purpose to open this conversation about adaptation, carbon removal, and SRM. Thus, answering this question, which you rightly have, of why are these issues not more in the public debate? Why are they not more part of the political space? We have uh, no other legitimacy than uh, our own decision to work as a group on this question, and our recommendations, when they come a year from now, will be put into the public and discussed. So the, the, the Climate Overshoot Commission precisely has as a purpose to open this conversation, given, given the very unfortunate likelihood of uh, overshooting uh, this 1.5. On, uh, on the scientific uh, advice available, uh, what is correct uh, is that uh, we want uh, people who are experts of SRM to be able to answer our questions. Uh, we, of course, will ask questions to other scientists than those who say uh, we are working uh, on SRM. Uh, I totally understand that others are not and that others may have arguments. We are open to them. And by the way, uh, 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 Frank uh, Biermann uh, knows that he's uh, one of the first whom we heard in the first meeting of the uh, Climate Overshoot Commission. So we are open to different views. And as a chair, I think I have a reasonable reputation of not being biased, uh, uh, except uh, that I belong to one part <laughs> of the political lecture in Europe. But apart from that, I think... Uh, I, I have as a duty to make it as objective as possible. Uh, the composition of the commission, I've already mentioned this point. I have made sure that those who in this sort of conversation so far have a disproportionately weak voice have a vast majority in the membership of the commission. Uh, and this is something I decided to have for the very reasons uh, that were uh, mentioned. And finally, uh, on the blue option, which was mentioned, uh, it, is part, it is part of the technical options which we are considering. And as a former Navy officer and as a chair of the EU Starfish mission, which is about regenerating the EU hydrosphere by 2030, if, if the ocean can be the solution uh, and not the atmosphere. I'm a big fan of this. I love the ocean. 
Yeah. Janusz. Thank you. Uh, and just to, in response to your, your question, Madam, um, so uh, uh, the Carnegie Climate Governance Initiative that I lead has its focus exactly on the question that you have posed. And our simple mission is to get these issues on the agenda of governments and some civil society organizations that work at the international level in order to encourage the conversations. We're doing this in an impartial manner. We're not for, we're not against. Uh, governments and uh, NGOs can sort out whether they're for or against. Our purpose is to encourage discussion. There we're not impartial. We want to encourage conversation and for conversation to happen, uh, we need also evidence, we need also ideology, we need also faith, we need ethics, we need lots of different things, but we also need evidence, and for that uh, we need uh, some research. Now, uh, we have managed over the years, the few years that we exist, we have managed to catalyze a few processes uh, in UN entities, uh, uh, UN Environment Assembly, uh, foundations that are now funding these kinds of activities uh, with um, intergovernmental processes and so on. So things are happening, and not simply because what, what we are doing, we're contributing to that, but things are beginning to happen and the conversations are beginning to take place. The fact that there is this meeting here, the fact that there is an overshoot commission, the fact that the Human Rights Commission is looking at the human rights aspects of solar radiation modification, these are all signs that the conversation is beginning to take place. Professor Gina? Anything to add to? Sure, I'll just piggyback off of what Janusz said. Um, also, in, in response to the question about catalyzing collaboration, so uh, definitely have great appreciation for the work Janusz has done with C2G, um, working with governments and NGOs. I think Andy Parker's work at Decimals is also worth noting, which is largely working to start get the conversation going um, among scientists in the Global South. And the project that I'm starting um, to build is more focused on global publics more broadly. So random, uh, random sampling of global publics in the Global South and working with the Stanford University Center for Deliberative Democracy um, to start getting some of those conversations going um, in that way as well. Any more questions? No? So you have to. There's a lady in the back. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I am Sarah Sandada. I am a journalist for the Swiss media Haiti News. And I, am, I have quite a down-to-earth question. Because when it comes to stratosphere injections of uh, aerosols, how can you make sure these aerosols will cover one specific part of the world and not another? And how do you make sure it won't eventually cause some uh, hunger in the world? Because we've already seen, w when it comes to volcanic eruptions, such as the Pinatubo eruption, that we have those kind of impacts. So I'm sure it's something that will be addressed by the different go governing bodies, governance bodies that you're talking about. But maybe you can tell us a few words about it. Thank you. Do you want to take that? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, a, a, a couple of points here. First, uh, uh, I, I think we should recognize Hans van der Lohe was right that there are many other solar radiation modification techniques other than stratospheric aerosol injection. But when we do talk about stratospheric in injection, that tends to be pretty much global and. Even if you try to do it at a hemispheric level, and there was recently a paper, some people looking at uh, addressing just the Arctic and the Antarctic regions, it will end up having global impact. So if you talk about stratospheric areas, you're talking about global. There's no question about it. However, the impacts will not necessarily be equal. And this is one of the challenges of the science and eventually of the governance of what happens uh, because we know fairly well from scientists that the temperature can be reduced. The question is how it will impact the actual climates that we get, because we're not going to get the old climate back. <laughs> that's, that's gone. Uh, so when you hear climate uh, restoration, forget it. It doesn't work. Uh, but, uh, but then the question is what happens to those people where it's going to get warmer, where it's going to get colder? These are the questions. But again, as I said earlier, the challenge is that, yes, there may be results that will make some hunger in some parts of the world, but the current climate policies are already doing it. <laughs> and so you have to make that comparison, which is going to be a better world, the one 
which lets the temperature go up to 1.5, 1.62, and who knows where else, and for how long, because we don't know, versus a world that tries to do uh, different kinds of solar radiation modification techniques. And that's the challenge. And it's not easy to do that, but that's what we have to do. Yeah. Oh, less bad. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I, I mean, that's Ga good. <laughs> Garnot has to end. <laughs> yeah. well, no. it's just a, it's a, a, quick, a quick point. So I agree with um, um, Janos um, that I would, I would go one further and say the fact that stratospheric aerosols as yes, one form of SRM, not SRM per se, um, is in fact largely global. And that's a feature, not a flaw. Right, so there's a couple of things here. So no, one, for example, no, it is not a weapon of war, right? Um, it is not something you direct at your enemies. It is a global intervention. That makes governance so challenging, so important. But yes, I would say it's a feature. Now, one uh, nuance on the um, unequal impacts. Um, I would interpret the research that has come out on um, global impacts of stratospheric aerosols, largely in that it looks a lot more equal than anyone, frankly, might have expected without looking at that research. Um, in other words, no um, unmitigated climate change plus SRM is not the same as no climate change at all. Of course not. But on basically all the things we can measure, average temperatures, extreme temperatures, average precipitation minus evaporation, extreme precipitation minus evaporation, hurricane strength, right? strength of tropical cyclones, a world with SRM, added on top of unmitigated climate change in the same large scale climate models we use to tell us how bad unmitigated climate change is in fact going to get, telling us we have to mitigate. Of course, right? Again, points one through 10, priorities one through 10, mitigate, cut CO2 emissions. But those same models tell us that, so far at least, um, adding a slow ramp up of stratospheric aerosols makes the world overall much closer to where we started before we started geoengineering the planet as one question of mentioned, uh, uh, comment of mentioned right, 180 or so years ago, right? Uh, we have been engaged in global experiments for quite a while here. Um, and frankly, that's good news too. That's the sort of science where you say, wait, we cannot dismiss this technology, this potential technology out of hand. Professor Okireki and Professor Wehrman also wants to address this question. And, but we, please be brief because we have other questions in the audience. Thank you. Well, thanks very much. Um, a couple of questions, uh, sorry, points. Um, first, let me start with the issue of the moral hazard. Um, we don't know how it's going to pan out, but what we can learn from experience is that we often tend to start with the idea that let's have this conversation, but in the end, the conversation always tends to move in the direction of those that have power and favor the, those that have uh, the, the money and the resources. When the issue of climate change action started many, many years ago, um, Africa has been you know, uh, banging on, on the fact that adaptation is a major focus. But what do we have? We have 75% of funding going to Africa, the little I already told you about, actually chasing mitigation action. Why? It is not because that was what was seen to be in the most uh, interest of Africa, but it was something that was designed to help developed countries to meet their obligations in the Kyoto Agreement and subsequently in the Paris Agreement. So there is a distinctive possibility that once you open or normalize this uh, geoengineering, 
it will dwarf again the primary concern of Africans, as we have seen clearly in the distribution of finance between mitigation and adaptation. Second point, my point is not to valorize ignorance. Quite opposite. The idea that we should experiment and research on everything. My question to Janot is, why are we not allowing African countries to experiment with nuclear weapons, uh, sorry, with nuclear energy as a way of also solving their energy crisis? Why have we banned knowledge exploration uh, in some countries and not others? The consequence I see with uh, moving on in this direction is again that we will have the knowledge localized, situated in certain countries that will use it and deny it other people. And in fact, sometimes use it in a way that is not consistent with the ethics and demands of those that are weak. When we had the COVID, uh, Africa had been shouting, we need to share the technology for COVID. Guess what? Nobody in the West agreed to do that. Um, and, and, and we had a situation where we were asking for the knowledge and the know-how, and nobody was of any uh, 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 forthcoming. So yes, we should have conversation, but the nature of conversation that we have tended to have on critical issues in the past have been conversation only in them uh, and a pretext for the interest of those that are privileged, that are powerful, to override the interests of those that are weak. Professor Beerman? Um, yeah, thank you. So, I think there are three points I want to make very, very quickly. Number one is the point to Janus Pasteur. I think we're doing actually a similar activity that what he does. I also believe in the plan A. There is only one plan A, which is adaptation and mitigation. And this is what our initiative, so we are also, our initiative is pretty much the same as his initiative, that we're just that we have a different plan A. And we worked also with governments. I mean, many governments are quite interested in the non-use agreement. So it's also the same. We are in dialogue with governments. And to the point about the degree, this initiative of bringing in people from the Global South into the debate, our call has been signed by quite a few scholars, leading scholars from the developing world that have supported our call for non-use agreements. So if you look at the list of signatories, it's probably the largest initiative in this field where lots of people from the developing countries, the Global South, have participated. And this is different from those who are supporting geoengineering. So it's actually an initiative that's very much driven by people from the Global South, including Jacques Okereke here and many others. Secondly, the point of academic freedom I think that is, um, is quite often made, but it's not about academic freedom. Academic freedom is extremely important. Research freedom is extremely important. But there are many issues where governments have decided for a very good reason to limit the technology development. I mentioned some technological technologies for chemical weapons, for biological weapons, for mining in Antarctica, for ozone depletion, for human cloning, for ocean fertilization. There are quite a few technologies that are not legal in many countries to be developed or under a stringent regulatory regime. And I think that is the tension between the freedom of research, which is extremely important. I work at a university, I love academic freedom, but there are certain things that people should not research because they cannot be handled, there's no governance, and they have negative consequences. And SRM is one of those things that have tremendously negative consequences because it will lock us in, in a world that has much higher carbon dioxide concentration. So therefore, this is a dangerous technology, and it should be banned like all other dangerous technologies. And the final part is about the Oberschutt Commission. And I agree with Sikina absolutely that the scientific advisors, if you look at the website, I mean, we know these people, they're all hardcore supporters of SRM. It's a very biased support organization. The scientific advisors are known for being leading advocates, advocates of geoengineering. It would be much better to have a much broader scientific advisory body for example, we have 350 scientists who have signed our call, and none of them has been really involved as a scientific advisor in the Overshoot Commission. That makes it not a very legitimate body. And the other point is when I discuss this with my students, they say it's not the right approach to have 
such an overshoot commission, they say it has to be dis discussed by the youth of the world. It has to be discussed by the youth because they will be around in 2050. It's their future. And we have to have a global debate of young people on these matters. And they want to have their voice in these matters. People from the global south and young people. So I think these are all issues that make the overshoot commission um, with all due respect to the to the to the to the to the very senior and very experienced and distinguished uh, experts that are there, uh, not fully legitimate in the eyes of many, including many of the young people and people in the global south probably as well. Thank so these are some points I want to raise, and I stop now. Thank you. Uh, would you like to? Uh just comment shortly before we take the last question from the I, I, Let's take the last one and maybe we'll come back to these points, okay. but I, I do want to. But uh, I think there was a question mm. there. Yeah, thank okay. you. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I will try to do this briefly. My, uh, my name is Katarina Gartfeldt. I'm director for the Swedish Polar Research Secretariat located in uh, northern Sweden, in Luleå, uh, very close to Kiruna Space, uh, space um, uh, agency and, uh, um, and S range and other facilities that we have there. Um, maybe you're aware, I guess you are, that there were some experiments planned there. Uh, now I have learned more, but I think it was to um, particles to the stratosphere. Correct me if I'm wrong. But those were, thank you. Uh, but those were stopped because there was a debate and um, everybody was not happy about it. So those experiments were stopped. Um, however, um, I'm also uh, chair of a national committee for the Royal Science of Academy, and we are planning a um, symposium in Luleå at Luleå Technical University on this very issue, uh, together with the Strategic Research Council in Sweden. And my first point is that I invite you all, panel, we have already planned to contact Gernot Wagner because we have read your book, but I now know now that there are books by, by Beerman and others here now. So, so this is an invitation to all of you. Please come to Luleå, northern Sweden. It will be January, February, something. We will contact you <laughs> because I really have appreciated <laughs> this. The problem for me now is that, that I agree with all of you. Uh, in the <laughs> Royal Academy Committee, we, we have discussed, okay, should we direct the symposium in Luleå into uh, this kind of discussion uh, about, um, well, uh, how to implement that and moral issues and so on? Or should we direct it to science that we actually are doing in northern Sweden and in space and so on? Uh, and um, what I have understood now is that it's quite not possible to divide it. There is a need for both discussion and for presentation of n new knowledge, if I have understood right. Uh, we can discuss that later. But I have one question, and that is for, uh, uh, for uh, Beerman. Um, and you, uh, you said, I think it was interesting when you gave so many examples of what was, uh, has been uh, internationally banned. You gave us several examples. Uh, but what I have learned is that the outer space, for example, is one of the shared uh, spaces, if, if spheres on, on uh, Earth or above our Earth, as is Antarctica and the deep so uh, sea floor bottom. Uh, in Antarctica, we have the Antarctic Treaty, which uh, bans, for example, wars and um, uh, unpeaceful... Uh, well, well, it's devoted to science and tourism. So... Well, it sounds so easy when you say to ban geoengineering, isn't because that is uh, connected to countries. But if it's connected to shared space, how would that be possible? That was a question about banning. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Professor Beerman, the question was for you. Okay, can I'm sorry, I waited for you to. So, <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, well, we, we, we do a lot of work actually. We have a, we have a team of lawyers, international lawyers, looking at all the other proprietary regimes, and we will soon come up with this book on, on these issues because this is very, very important to learn from them. And just for the regimes that you mentioned, I mean, Antarctica is, of course, um, it is a shared space, but it would certainly be, I mean, any activity in the space of geoengineering would be done by a state party. 
I mean, I fully agree. I think it was Gernot Wagner who said that it's very unlikely to have a business actor. These green finger scenarios are not likely. They're very likely to support research on, on, on these issues and to lobby for it, as they do already for carbon removal. But they're not likely to run this alone. So any space, even space out the national jurisdiction, the states would be responsible. So our vision is that states agree, like they have done in many of the other treaties that I mentioned, and there are many more treaties where states have agreed not to engage in a certain activity because states have overwhelmingly felt this is an activity that is harmful to humanity. And we believe that the same way in which Mining in Antarctic, for example, has been banned. That's the one you mentioned. Or well, there are restrictions on deep seabed mining. There are lots of restrictions on the use of outer space. So we believe that SRM is one of these technologies that are harmful for humanity because they accelerate the much much worse. They will make the climate problem. They will lead us to a world of much higher emissions. And they cannot be governed in a fair and democratic manner, especially if you look at the Global South countries. They will be governed, if at all, by some big major powers that will kind of use this. And I think it's also not a coincidence that those, the, the country that is almost exclusively contributing to this debate is a country with the highest per capita emissions from the OECD countries, I mean, from the large countries. United States of America, 17, 18 tons per capita are being emitted, double the size of what the Europeans emit. So I think it's no coincidence that these are the countries, this is the country that embeds most on these kind of debates. And I think other countries should just work together and try to stop this knowledge before it is too late. And that's what we want to do. The same way in which Janus Pasta wants to do. We engage with governments, we talk to governments, we talk to NGOs. We are supported with all the, by most of the Swedish NGOs that have argued against the test in, in Sweden. They're also supporting us and we're working together. Um, so I hope we will have a future that I can give a future to my child that will not be a future with SRM. Thank you. Thank you. Uh we need to finish, but I'll give you, I'll give you just a quick, uh, just a little bit of time to, to address. Uh, okay, uh, then, uh, then I will just focus yeah. on uh, three sentences. First, I think, Frank, it's difficult to compare what you do and what we do, because you have a clear outcome in view, which is fine. I welcomed your initiative in a blog, because I think it's a governance pr process that we need to have. C2G does not have an outcome in view. We're simply encouraging conversations. Secondly, uh, we're asking, we're saying that it cannot be governed by the countries we have, but we're asking these same countries to ban it. This is the same governance processes that we need to make work somehow. We know how difficult it has been on UNFCCC, the climate negotiations. We need to find ways to do it. And I know it can be done. It's hard work. It will take time. I have grandchildren, and I'm also working for that to make sure that they have a better life. And the last point, and this is important, we talked a lot about moral hazard today, but nobody has talked about the moral imperative. The moral imperative that if, if the situation is as bad as it looks, we may actually have to figure this out. And our, my granddaughter, who will be an adult when it gets really, really bad, she will look back and say, why didn't you at least research it? and find out whether it was really possible or not. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you, online guests. And we are probably going to discuss more this on the Just the Summit <laughs> later, because there is an in Sweden <laughs> after this. Thank you very much. Thank you.